welcome everyone to this marvelous Saturday evening presentation with Dr. Joy DeGruy. This is the program sponsored by the Baha'i Publishing Trust and the Wilmot Institute as part of the Publishing Trust weekend about writers and writing. And so we are adding to that particular program a, a special evening session. Today we had a great session about children's literature and junior youth literature. Tomorrow there will be presentations about historical writing and then there will be a publisher's panel where people will be able to ask their questions to the publishing trust and George Ronald and to the person in charge of literature review. That's really quite a nice combination of things tomorrow as well. So we hope you can join us. I'm very pleased tonight to introduce Dr. Joy DeGru. Her research focuses on the intersection of racism, trauma, violence, and American chattel slavery. She has over 30 years of practical experience as a professional in the field of social work. She conducts seminars, lectures, and trainings in the field of intergenerational and historical trauma, mental health, social justice, improvement strategies, and evidence-based model development. Her book, Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome, is a groundbreaking work, has been widely discussed and written about in the field of African-American studies. Tonight, she will be speaking about her upcoming book titled, tentatively, I guess, <laughs> Enviably Poised, A Black Family's Journal Journey to Justice and Faith, talking about her own family. But in addition, Joy is a keen observer of the human condition, and this makes her a great storyteller, which is one of the most important talents any speaker or presenter, presenter can have. Wow. Being, able, being <laughs> able to connect your audience to the ideas you wish to convey to them is perhaps the most important skill anyone can have. And Joy has this ability to a greater degree than just about anyone I know. <laughs> Therefore, I am very happy and honored to introduce Dr. Joy DeGruy. Wow. Take it, Joy. I will okay. I have my microphone, and I will be enjoying every minute. Excellent. Well, um, this is just an amazing uh, moment. It's an amazing time that we're in. Um, I am currently, and you can't tell anybody, I'm in Costa Rica. Um, I live a part of the time here in Costa Rica. It was my plan B, my family's plan B uh, uh, for a long time. And I'm very happy. My family's coming to visit. Um, Oscar and Jamal are, will be here in June. And so I am, I'm really excited. And I'm also um, keenly aware uh, that these are indeed pregnant times that we are living in. You all know it. You can all see it. The Guardian made it very clear that we would we would understand and see it happening before our eyes, that process of disintegration and uh, that uh, mission and vision of Baha'u'llah that takes us on a trajectory of unifying humanity. Um, I wanted to, you know, I kept thinking about this uh, when I was invited and I love Nat. Nat, thank you for really encouraging me to do this and to, to do the book, to finish the book. I'm not quite finished. I'm herding cats when it comes to my family and try to do a book on our family because everybody has to tell their story and they'll be mad at me if I don't tell it right. <laughs> right. So um, I kind of wanted to kind of start at the beginning, I guess. Um, and of course, I, you know, I grew up in the AME church um, and the book talks about our journey through um, to get to the point where we are, we are Baha'is. And I think that you'll find it interesting. Some of the stories I'm going to tell today, I'm going to tell some directly from uh, the book and then talk a little bit about how and, and why I got where I am. So thank you all for joining. Um, this is exciting for me. So I'm going to start with how we, I came up with the name. I came up with the name and then the family, you know, kind of introduced their perspectives. This was a letter written um, that I'm going to read is a letter written from the Universal House of Justice to the sisters uh, that traveled to uh, the southern region of Africa in 1994. This is their response to our letter informing them of our intentions and our travel teaching goals. The Universal House of Justice was touched by the spirit of your letter. 
And we are to assure you of its loving prayers at the Holy Threshold for the confirmation of your aspirations and service to the cause of God. Unquestionably, the African-American believers are enviably poised to bring the life-giving teachings of Baha'u'llah to persons of African heritage living in the United States, as well as to the people of Sub-Saharan Africa itself, with whom they share a common ancestry. Shoghi Effendi especially encouraged Black American believers to pioneer to Africa, and there have been some who heeded that call, serving the cause with great distinction and to great effect, but many more are needed. Be assured that the House of Justice will also pray for the success of your teaching efforts in which it is keenly interested. And this is written on behalf of the Universal House of Justice, um, the February 14th, 1994. So that statement of being enviably poised was such a powerful, um, just a powerful statement. What does it mean to be enviably poised? Uh, and I thought about my family's journey, uh, my father, my mother, um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about them. Uh, but before I do that, I, I want to talk about um, a story that kind of gave me this kind of appreciation for The Guardian and the importance of words. And this is a story of Mr. Salah, I believe is his name. Uh, when I first went on pilgrimage uh, to Haifa, it was in 1984. And I remember before I went, it's like everybody that gets ready to go uh, on pilgrimage. You know, you, you get your list together um, and you figure out all the people that want you to have prayers. I, I sent the list out. What, who do you want me to pray for? Is there anything specific? Is there a particular shrine? And I had a huge list and I literally covered everyone on that list in the manner, the prayer, the place that they wanted it. So I'd gone to a friend at the time. I was living in Maywood, California, home from pioneering. And so I went to my friend, Linda Garcia. And uh, I, you know, I told her I was going to, uh, to Haifa and I was explaining to her a little bit about the Holy Land. And I was talking to her specifically about some of the statements that the Guardian had said about Haifa and about pilgrimage. And, she said, you know, I find it very, very difficult to read The Guardian. I, very, very difficult. <laughs> and, um, and I find his, the way he writes, he seems very cool, very kind of cold and aloof is kind of the way she defined The Guardian. Now, I can remember as a youth uh, attempting to read, what was I trying to read? God passes by. I was trying to read something. And all I know is I would read the same page over and over and over again because I just couldn't retain it. I just... You know, I don't know why, but I kept trying. And eventually I fell in love with The Guardian. I truly fell in love with The Guardian. And uh, so when I got to, to Haifa, one of the places that we went um, was to the grave site, which is in, in London, of, of Shoghi Effendi. So I went to Shoghi Effendi's grave. So we go, we go in and we walk up and we are, we are saying prayers. And we, I think we had flowers. I can't remember we were lying down flowers. And suddenly this individual, as soon as we kind of backed, we're backing out uh, from the guardian's resting place, this just gentleman runs in, cleans up all the flowers, the dead flowers that are around and just disappears, right? So I was like, who was that man? And then there was this little, um, it was like a little, a little space, like a, like a little cabin, a tiny miniature cabin that, um, we saw him go into. So we went over and he was really sweet and wonderful. And he came out and he talked about the, you know, he was actually caring for the, for the, for the guardian's resting place. And he had actually cared for the guardian while he was alive and had asked the house of justice, if he could continue in that, uh, in the guardian's death, that he wanted to continue to care for that, for that space. So here I am now, you know, this is one of those where you foot in mouth, the foot went directly in the mouth on this one because me in my list of all the things that I, I was going to do when I was, you know, in these, these places, these holy spaces, uh, I said, oh, by the way, I have a friend and she lives with, you know, in my community in Maywood. And, you know, she made a statement about how uh, it was difficult for her to read the garden that she found him cool, kind of cold and aloof. And the moment those words came out of my mouth, the moment I, I, I just was like, oh, my God, what have I said? 
What have I said to a human being that has devoted his entire life to the guardian? As they were coming out of my mouth, I realized that I had, I just, I just, all I could do is just sit there and be silent and stupid, right? And he didn't say anything. It was like, you talk about a pregnant pause. So there's this pregnant pause. And I'm like, someone kill me. Just shoot me now, right? You fool. And he said, I, and he had tears in his eyes. He didn't cry, but his eye, you could tell it, he was emotional about it. And I was just trying to go get someone distract him so I can run. And he finally said, when you go back home, tell your friend that when she reads the prayers of the Bab of Baha'u'llah, of Abdul Baha, and she finds her heart lifted by those prayers, tell her that the guardian would labor for weeks over a single word so that very thing would happen to her heart. I will never forget that moment. And when I returned home from pilgrimage, I told her that story and she fell on her knees and burst into tears. And I, it was, I think as much, even perhaps even more for me, the importance of words, the importance of the written word, the importance of the spoken word. And when he described how much the guardian would labor to make certain those words were right. I knew that it was going to send me on another kind of a journey. And so I wanted to start with that story because the story was perhaps my beginning understanding and appreciation for not only the importance, but the power uh, that words carry and why it is important for us uh, to, to choose them wisely. So, I think I'm going to start. Let me see. <laughs> this is, you know, you all are familiar with this statement, and this is the the actual statement that um, really inspired me to write the book Post Traumatic. Um, and it was this statement. And you got to remember, uh, I I became a Baha'i. I probably Oscar would never agree with this, but probably before him, I was like 12 or 13, and I was good with it. <laughs> you know. I went to the first fire set. I'm like, I'm good. This is it. And, and on top of it, they share cookies and stuff at the firesides and cakes and wonderful stuff. It was working for me. Oscar, of course, was very, very hesitant because, you know, he was, you know, involved in the movement, the Black Power movement, and was very, very reticent about accepting anything that there were lots of white people involved in because his whole thought was this is just another game to try to oppress us or whatever, right? But, you know, I was like, I was like Yogi and, and Boo Boo. I'm going, Hey, Yogi, I like him. But it was this statement um, that I'm going to read that most of you are, are, are familiar with. And of course, there is a, con a, a corresponding statement. Uh, but this is the one that led me on my, on my research uh, with regard to uh, post-traumatic. Let the white make a supreme effort in their resolve to contribute their share to the solution of this problem to abandon once for all their usually inherent and at times subconscious sense of superiority, to correct their tendency towards revealing a patronizing attitude towards the members of the other race, to persuade them through their intimate, spontaneous, and informal association. And I want to unpack those words in a moment. Intimate, spontaneous, an informal association with them, of the genuineness of their friendship and the sincerity of their intentions, and to master their impatience of any lack of responsiveness on the part of a people who have received for so long a period such grievous and slow healing wounds. It is those words that set me on my path to find out, indeed, what were those wounds that the guardian spoke about, not during slavery, not, you know, in some weathered distant past, not so long ago, the guardian said these words. I believe he, th these words came from, it was either the forties or 38 that he wrote them. I'm sure somebody on there knows the, the actual um, date that the advent was written. But I wanted to just say these words to you. Appalling, atrocious, 
calamitous, damaging, deplorable, dire, dreadful, egregious, flagrant, glaring, heinous, intolerable, lamentable, monstrous, outrageous, shameful, shocking, tragic, unbearable. That is what the word grievous means. And I think about that word, and I think about the fact that the guardian chose it. And so I knew in my investigation of the depth of that injury, the depth of those wounds, even though I didn't understand on the front end what any of that meant until I did the deep dive. But I wanted to, to, to in, in focusing in on that, on that word grievous, um, and I've never heard it actually used that way in any other literature that I've found that, that even express or share any history of the struggles of people of African descent, only the guardian. And I, and I think about what he said needed to happen because the guardian was very, very, very deliberate and intentional about the words that he chose. He used the word intimate, spontaneous, informal association. Now, if you think wherever you are, to who those folks in your life are that respond and engage you in an intimate, spontaneous, and informal way. And that is someone who is your, your friend. It's your friend. He's, he's describing friendship. Because your friends, you know, are the ones that don't call you before they knock on the door or, you know, drop off something or check in. They just show up because it's, they're your friend. And really the answer to so many of, of, of the questions about this divide that this country is now struggling so horrifically with. And the, the good news is that at least everyone can see it now, what people of color have been seeing for so long. It's so wonderful and it's so sad that we have come to this. But this is what The Guardian warned about. This is what Abdul Baha warned about. And this is what people of color have had to struggle with their entire lives is the reality of these words. And at the same time, to understand that this, the remedy is not so far away. The remedy, like I remember, uh, I think it was Jim Nelson. It was Jim Nelson who gave an analogy and he talked about being someone who loved gourmet food. And he describes why he loves it. And he loved it because of, you know, he says you have your onions and you have these, the garlic and you have all of this, you know, these wonderful herbs. And he says, and they, you, they're just wonderful. You can smell them, you can taste them. He says, but none of it matters unless they have proximity. They can't be left off to the side. They have to be combined as the ingredients to the whole meal. That's what makes it savory. That's what makes it gourmet. That's what makes it wonderful. It's proximity. And he was saying that to talk about the issue of race and racism, that it's proximity, you see. So long as we can continue the lie, the boogeyman, they're, they're terrible. They're awful. You don't want to near, be near them. You know, you know, they're violent. You know, they're all of the things that people say, so long as you can keep the lie going. But you see, the lie dissipates in the presence of interaction, in the presence of friendship, in the presence of proximity, just like darkness, you know, dissipates in the presence of light. And it is that willingness, again, intimate, spontaneous, informal. And it's interesting, I keep saying those words because as a Baha'i, there are those people who, you know, I can show you pictures of my family and my extended family and my fictive kinship who are of all different races from every walk of life, from every socioeconomic background. These people in my life, in my family, in my world, that this isn't difficult. They don't have to stop and go back and go, gee, if we're, are we being intimate? Are we being spontaneous? And are we being informal? No, because we are, we're in love. We don't have to look for those things when you have that genuine relationship, which is what my work was born from. So um, I also, I don't know if, if later on we, we want to entertain questions because I know I'm saying a lot and I'm going through a lot. So I'm going to read... The first, <laughs> the very first thing I wrote actually, 
And I wrote this uh, piece, um, and again, starts with Envi Enviably Poised, A Black Family's Journey to Justice and Faith. Um, I wrote this particular piece. It's called Like Crackle Glass. I wrote it in 2005, and I wrote it about my family. I don't know if you know what crackle glass is. I, um, for those of you that um, don't know what crackle glass is, I'm certain that you've seen it. Um, you'll see a beautiful, a beautiful vase, or you'll see a, a maybe even um, a lamp. And what it is, is it looks like the glass fragmented, but in place. So it's a little cracked glass, but it's all in place. And um, it's quite beautiful, exquisite actually. Um, but I'm gonna explain why I call my family, uh, I say they are like crackled glass. It is made by dipping molten glass into cold water and reheating it. The result is shattered pieces held perfectly together, create, creating the appearance of smoothness amidst a myriad fragmented parts. Enhanced with light, this glass becomes a dazzling spectacle of dancing silhouettes. The remarkable exquisiteness of crackle glass is in its flaws. Like crackle glass, our beauty coexists with our imperfections. Fear and doubt compel us to construct a character free of shortcomings, to appear whole and strong, unaware that despite such efforts, our brokenness plainly shows. Like crackle glass, we remain oblivious to our deficiencies and therefore blind to our magnificence. Powerless to perceive, feel, or to know that with one step towards the light, we can see clearly that we are beautiful and loved. So crackle glass, every time I see it now, I can't help but think about all the things we do in this life uh, to appear perfect, to appear unflawed. Um, and, and that's okay, I guess, you know, it's not a, a criticism. It's, it's just a kind of a human characteristic to try to hide, to try to be what we think everyone wants us to be. Um, so I'm going to now start with my introduction. There's also going to be a forward. I'm still trying to figure out who's going to write the forward. It is not going to be me, <laughs> but there are several people I'm thinking about writing the forward. It was difficult to determine where to begin our family story. Our DNA show our origins coming from West Africa, Sierra Leone, and the Mende tribe, and from Western Europe and the Netherlands. Most recently, we hail from Belize and Louisiana. I am the youngest daughter of parents who in the early 1950s sought the warmth of other sons. The 50s marked a period of political and social turbulence making way for change in human interactions and perceptions, the full meaning and impact of which would influence America and indeed the world for decades to come. The 1950s heralded in a time of portentous movements and a renewed energy for meaningful struggle. America witnessed the birth of a unique African-American epic where black people accelerated their efforts toward full citizenship, refusing to passively accept the role of the subordinate treated as aliens in the only country they knew. It is the strength born from such struggles that enabled Elizabeth Eckford to walk with confidence and dignity through the hate charged crowd up the steps and into the door of Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. The same strength that moved Rosa Parks to find her place by simply remaining in her seat. When my siblings and I talk about Louisiana, we often refer to it as another country because Louisiana's legal system is based upon a civil code that was established under the Napoleonic system of civil law and differs from the other 49 states practices of the common law. In the beginning of the 19th century, thousands of refugees arrived in New Orleans, both black and white. There were free people of color and also enslaved Africans among them. Hence, places like Algiers, Louisiana, owes its name to a city in the North African country of Algeria. Algiers is the second oldest neighborhood in the city of New Orleans that historically housed enslaved Africans brought there from Senegal and the Gambia. 
Louisiana's notorious Angola State Penitentiary was named after a former plantation that housed enslaved Africans that were largely from Angola in Central Africa. For my family, all this history translated into a different set of rules governing their lives and the daily lives of all Louisiana inhabitants, especially its black citizens. However, by far the greatest single act of courage for our family began with our father who modeled his belief that one must have the courage and conviction to speak truth to power wherever it reared its head. This process began early on in the lives of the DeGru children as soon as our curiosity arose and speech was possible. My family left the South, New Orleans, for very much the same reasons identified in Isabel Wilkerson's epic tale of the migration of African-Americans from Southern cities and towns across the antebellum South. My father left New Orleans having obtained only a sixth grade education. My mother left turning down a four year scholarship to college. They left to save their lives and the lives of their children, both born and yet to be born. My father was a unique person for his time and place of birth. He was known for his kindness and his selfless service to others, for his amazing storytelling and his unrelenting loyalty to his family. He did not take on the bitterness and pain that was rife for anyone growing up black in Louisiana. Instead, he saw a bright future for our family and went about creating it. My father and mother moved west to California along with a number of our extended family members. We were raised among many of our aunts and uncles and numerous cousins. We were brought up to be thinkers and leaders. We were repeatedly told that, quote, we came from smart people. This empowering statement has been passed along to four generations of my family members and has been made evident by the lives that we live and the legacy we carry forth, a legacy of courage, of determination, endurance, civil rights activism, social justice, and spiritual transformation. My older siblings were encouraged to express themselves in the ideological debates of the 1960s and the 70s. My brother was involved with the Black Panther movement and my sister was and still is an activist, having obtained her advanced degrees in political science and public policy. It was under their tutelage with the echoed voices of my parents and grandparents whispering encouragement in my ear that my journey began. At the age of 11, I won my first debate arguing the philosophical differences and the utility and effectiveness of the strategies of Malcolm X and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Reading the writings of these two monumental giants instilled in me a recognition and respect for struggle and sacrifice and set me on the path of a lifelong journey towards black social activism. In college, I honed my skills in communication, psychology and social work theory and practice. This provided me with a strong foundation upon which to build a theoretical framework for affecting change in what I perceived to be a long-term injurious cleavage in the social and physical fabric of African-American life. If you look closely, you will see that my family is like crackle glass, stunningly beautiful, beaming light through fragmented lives. Each one of us unique and varied in capacity with small and large gifts and strength. We are diverse in thought and character, knowledge and experience. All of the pieces fit together and bind us to a common heritage and memory, adding to the richness of our family and culture. This story, our story, has a happy ending, though there will be a recounting of times when things weren't pleasant or happy. The characters are real people with real lives, real crisis, real victories. Some characters are colorful and charismatic and some quietly fly below the radar seeking to go unnoticed. I will speak of all of them because everyone is important in this story. The protagonists and the villains, the trusted confidants and the strangers like all have a sacred place in the telling of my family's journey of discovery and faith. So let me, for a moment, um, talk a little bit about the goal of this book. And then I'll read a, a, another piece. I've read a lot of um, stories about Baha'is. And I would think and hope that, you know, when I, I think in the future, my grandchildren, that this book will be their legacy. But it'll be told a little differently. I want to talk about how we came 
to understand, recognize, and embrace the manifestation of God for this day. I want to talk about that. But I don't want to be remiss and not notice what is going around on around us the whole time. In other words, what was happening in the world for people that look like me? When I think about Lewis Gregory, Robert Turner, when I think about all of all of these individuals, I mean, um, it's fine, they are, right? I, it, however far, when I think about these Black people, I think about what was life like for them then? How did, how did anti-Blackness show itself for them? How did they navigate these spaces? How did they keep hope and love and joy alive? So when I tell the story of my family, I'm going to be telling the story of Black people. I'm going to be telling about what was going on, not just for my family, but for the other folks that look like me, so that the reader will know that we were in touch with those things. I hope that makes sense. Because I know I need to know that. When I started reading recently some of the stories, uh, some of the letters about from Black people, I didn't even know they'd written the Abdu Baha, letters that I've never seen anywhere else that are beginning to emerge. Hopefully there will be a book that shares what's happening behind the scenes. What were Black people asking of Abdu Baha when they weren't in polite company? What were people writing in their letters to unburden their hearts? What was going on in their world during that time? And surely, uh, as, a, as a source, why, I wanna, why do I want to do it? Because I want to encourage people. My book, as intense as my book is and my work is, I cannot express to you the impact this book has had around the world. I just... Matter of fact, when I, when I wrote the book, um, I just finished doing uh, some work for the MacArthur Foundation. MacArthur Foundation uh, funded, gave me non-restricted funds and said to me, Joy, go do your work. And so my sister, Iris, if anybody knows Iris, is like, Iris isn't a pure administrator. She goes, yes, we're going to need to know the deliverables. And they said, what, do, what does Dr. DeGruy now do? She goes, well, I, I say, I do trainings, I do workshops, I do, con- do more of that. <laughs> Just do more of it, unrestricted. But we want you to take it to the community, Joy. We want you to tell the people don't, that don't get to hear. So for the past year, I have been traveling and I'm very excited. We, uh, my, in, my brilliant nephews, uh, M- 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 um, Ifanyi and Jamal, uh, have been really recording, taking pictures and, and ultimately f- uh, formulating a documentary. But they have kind of taken a snapshot of all of these symposiums that I've done. Um, one in uh, Portland, in Los Angeles, in San Francisco, in Seattle, and, and, um, and in June, it, we'll have one um, in Atlanta. But the reason why I'm sharing this with you is because part and parcel to my work in my Baha'i community. I'm on the local spiritual assembly uh, in uh, uh, South DeKalb, uh, a Baha'i community. We just had our conference, conferences going on now. Um, I am not in the country, so I'm not able to be there. But as much work as we do as a community and in our cluster, and we're doing incredible teaching work and incredible uh, work in general in our community, uh, we, that's part of our, the goal here, proximity, right? And I want the reader to know that we had proximity to the realities of what was going on with the people who don't have a voice, the invisible people, the people that folks maybe even sometimes avoid or have avoided their whole lives. I want that to make that alive. I want to bring that to the forefront. And so you will find integrated in this book, those stories and our stories, because they impact one another. They impact what was going on the outside impacted our hearts and souls and our minds and our insistence upon the best beloved of all things in God's sight, which was justice. Those things inspired us as well that got us to the table. And so I think um, and it's no you know, I'm not I'm not pouring any salt on any uh, biographies or autobiographies or any historical accounts of what has happened to people. And I know that there are some really clear guidelines, but I have to tell the truth. I have to tell the truth so that people that look like me go, yes, she felt it. She knew it. She walked through the world like I walked through the world. She saw and felt the things that I saw and felt 
And still she rose. And still she embraced joy and peace and unity. She did that. How did she do that? How did they as a family do that? And I think that I don't know. I've never done this before. This is going to be my very first time. So I'm sure I'm, uh, I'm going to make some uh, missteps here. But I, I certainly want to bring that in. So when you hear me integrate that in the writing, it's purposeful. It's intentional. Uh, because I think in the future, people will want to know. Where were the Baha'is? Where were the Black Baha'is when <laughs> the stuff happened at the Capitol, when the shooting occurred, when they killed Trayvon? They're going to know, where were you? Did you feel what we felt? Does that make sense? So uh, that's what makes this book a challenge because I got to figure out what to put in and what to leave out. Uh, so um, that has been the most, actually the most difficult part of this was, you know, having to get outside of my own uh, selfish uh, and my own actual professional engagement in community. Uh, but I'm really excited about what has happened so far. Uh, I feel very blessed. I feel, I feel encouraged by all our institutions. I feel um, kissed in a certain way that uh, when you are going and moving and not sure of yourself and then, you know, Baha'u'llah sends you the confirmations, opens the doors uh, where other doors were shut. So I went to, let's see, where are we in time? Somebody tell me. <laughs> I know I was supposed to pay attention. Okay, so it's 637. All right, so I have, uh, what, how much time? Keep there? going. Keep, Keep going. going. Okay, Keep so. Going. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to read this piece, which is such a powerful, uh, powerful piece. Um, and it's about my mother. And it's a true story. I mean, everything I'm going to talk about is a true story. This was also one of those things where, uh, where, where I'm trying to get stories because I'm the youngest of, of my siblings. I'm the youngest. So there's what I remember. Then there's what Oscar remembers. Then there's what Iris remembers, right? So I'm trying, uh, I'm talking to them going, how do you remember this? So most of the stories are pretty straightforward. I only have a couple of them where there's some question in the story about its origin, whether it came from my father or my uncle. I, and I'm just not even going to get into it. It's, it's in the book. I'm just writing it as I, I remember it, uh, as it was told to me by my father. Um, Okay, so this is a story, and each one of, by the way, the, each one of the chapters of the book uh, is preceded by pictures. So you'll see pictures of my of my grand my my grandparents. Um, there's a story about my my mother's mother, my mother's grandmother, who was a result of a relationship. She was half black and half white. Um, she was. Uh, placed in um, in a in, in a box on a box in a, uh, by her father because he was black and the mother was white and so they had to get out of town so they were on a buckboard uh, wagon and they kind of got out of <laughs> got out of wherever they were and so that story is a very interesting one where I, we just even very recently got names. Um, but we don't have a lot of information on them. You can imagine why uh, it was truly prohibited what they did. Uh, and somehow, you know, uh, my great grandmother emerged um, through that process. And uh, so on April 6, 1931, my mother, Nellie Parker, was born. She was named after her grandmother. And she was the youngest of three children, a brother, Albert, who died of tuberculosis at the age of two. Her elder sister, Irene, older by two years. My mother was a beautiful, happy and gifted child, known to her friends and family for her beautiful smile and her kind manner. In high school, my mother was band leader and was able to write music for and play all of the wind instruments. And she also marched and performed in the marching band. She was about eight or nine years old when she was diagnosed with spinal meningitis, for which there was no cure at the time. Penicillin would not be available to them until years later. My mother was already showing signs of the disease's progression, a stiff neck and fever. There was a steady flow of visitors in and out of the house asking about her condition and offering prayers and comfort to grandmother Ophelia. Among them was Frank, Ophelia's brother and my mother's favorite uncle. Uncle Frank rarely left her bedside and prayed fervently for her, her recovery every day. The disease had progressed to the point where the doctors no longer held out any hope for a recovery, believing that everything that could be done had been done. 
They recommended that the family prepare for the inevitable. The next time Uncle Frank came to visit, he was happy and smiling because of a dream he had. He shared that in the dream, he saw a man lifting up my mother and that he knew instantly that my mother was going to be all right. A few days after Uncle Frank's visit, my mother made a full recovery without the use of antibiotics. The doctors called it a miracle, but it was clear to my family that my mother's life was not to end that day. She was destined for something beyond what anyone could conceive. It was many years later that Uncle Frank and Auntie Melda came to visit the family in California. We had all gathered at my brother Oscar and his wife Freddie's home in Los Angeles. Uncle Frank was advanced in years, but his mind was sharp and he still laughed heartily and told stories about his life and experiences. He and Aunt Imelda were sitting on the couch and everyone was moving about, preparing for dinner, listening to music, when suddenly Uncle Frank began to cry. He had walked over to look at something on a shelf in Oscar and Freddie's living room. He was standing in front of a small picture that was sitting there on the shelf. Imelda went over to him and said something about how emotional he had become in his old age. But Uncle Frank wept, his eyes fixed as he pointed to the picture. Oscar came down from upstairs and immediately went over to comfort him. And with tears rolling down his face, I'm sorry, it's hard to get through this. Uncle Frank said, that's the man that lifted Nellie up. He was pointing to a picture of Abdul Baha. He said that the man in the picture was a man from his dream. Soon we were all crying. Some of us had an inkling of what this meant and others were simply stunned and rendered speechless. For obvious reasons, <laughs> Monday, April 6, 1931, marked an important date for me because it marked the beginnings of my immediate family with the birth of my mother. But it also marked an important date in African-American history. On the same day my mother was born, one of the most renowned cases in the history of the American legal system occurred, the case of the Scottsboro Boys. There were nine black teenagers accused of raping two white women. It was a lie. Even after one of the alleged victims confessed that the story was fabricated and testified that none of the nine Scottsboro defendants as much as even touched either of the women, they were still found guilty. There were three trials in all. The case was eventually sent to the US Supreme Court. Charges for four of the nine were dropped. Sentences for the rest ranged from 75 years to death. One was shot while being escorted to prison by a sheriff's deputy and permanently disabled. Two escaped, were later charged with other crimes and sent back to prison. The oldest defendant sentenced to death in the final trial jumped parole in 1946 and went into hiding. He was found 30 years later in 1976 and pardoned, by which time the case had been thoroughly shown to be a gross injustice. This was a world that awaited my mother, a world where justice for black people was a vague wish and peace was a guarded hope. I'll stop there. <laughs> um, so that, the, the, yeah, the, it's, it's, uh, it's been thick. And um, at the same time, there are all of these things going through my mind. You know, I was there when Uncle Frank uh, was crying. I was there. Um, and here was someone who had never knew nothing uh, really about the Baha'i faith, spent all his life in Louisiana and on this visit, which was rare and unusual. Um, our family, of course, those of us in, that were there that were Baha'is, we all knew. We just, you know, we knew. And then we also knew that there was something incredibly mysterious about our family uh, in that uh, somehow my my God saw fit to save my mother. Uh, not any way for her to know that all of her children uh, would embrace the faith. 
Um, so I think, again, uh, this is um, a very a difficult to write story. Um, but I'm excited and I am grateful and I'm honored to, to put pen to paper to make the lives of people who would otherwise be invisible, be visible. Even if it's just us that read it, <laughs> even if at the end of the day, it's just us. I, I just really feel um, a, a strong responsibility here uh, on a lot of levels, on a lot of uh, levels. And I'm sure, you know, I'm going to be seeking guidance from some of the incredible people that are part of the, the, the publishing trust that have so much wisdom. I hope to be uh, able to, to also ch uh, kind of listen in tomorrow um, about looking at historical accounts. And, and I know that specifically when you're talking about people's lives in my book, in my book, uh, Post Traumatic, um, the first rendering of the book, I didn't tell a story, a particular story. Um, of an individual that I did talk about in the, my revision, I actually included who is biracial. Um, and uh, I didn't mention his real name because he had passed away. I didn't know if his family, any of his family would ever read my book. Um, so I you know, changed the name to protect the innocent, so to speak. But I felt like his story needed to be told and I pray for him. Uh, he's on my prayer list, I, people who know my prayer list. Uh, he's been on my prayer list since he passed away, and he actually took his life. But um, I thought his story needed to be told as a biracial person growing up in a racist uh, society, growing up where he couldn't fit and didn't fit anywhere. Um, but, you know, those are the stories. So you may, um, I'm not sure how it's going to hit people. Like, I didn't know how post-traumatic was going to hit people, you know. And right now, you know, um, I have people uh, that that will come up to me and tell me things that speak to me. And, you know, I just, I have no idea how how or why the book has impacted them in such an incredible, uh, incredible and positive way. Uh, but I realize that it's not about me. You know, it's bigger than me. And that's why stories need to be told. And I remember um, there was a, well, not an argument, but there was a uh, a, a, a healthy debate that was going on uh, in a Baha'i community many years ago about individuals that write about things that Baha'u'llah and Abdu Baha'i Shogafini write about. It's like, how dare you write about something that they've written about? You're not, we don't need you to, you know, <laughs> to, um, to share whatever you think. We don't need you to, to then elaborate on something. And of course, the Guardian said the total opposite. He says, there are plenty of people that aren't going to get it directly from even one of the central figures, but may get and understand and embrace the faith as a result of someone else's recounting of their understanding of it. And I remember um, reading about that and how important it is and how sometimes, like I said, when I say it's really not about you, sometimes it's really not. It's not about me. Right. Really, really not. There are things that have happened and I'm sure it's happened to you where, you know, some, something will happen and you'll go, OK, that uh, I don't know who that was for. <laughs> I don't know what this was about. But somehow God used me just now, and it's maybe the answer to somebody else's prayer, but it don't have nothing to do with me. And I really do believe a lot of our lives, if we listen, we can, uh, what Freddie would say to me, my sister-in-law would say, um, uh, standing in the right attitude of God, uh, that you can be used as an instrument. So um, with all that, I think um, I will end there. If there are some questions or thoughts, I'm happy to entertain them. Or if that's not the thing that happens, that's fine too. <laughs> Well, you can be sure there'll be questions. First of all, I know we have several, but on top of that, I have three for you. Three, okay. I have three questions for you. And, um, and I'm sure other people will have questions as well, but this gives them some time to think about the questions and put them in. All right. The first question is, can you list the cast of characters in the book a bit? Because I don't know your family. I, I've heard of Oscar, of course, but I've, oh, never, met, I've never met Oscar. And and I don't know your sister Iris at all. So tell us tell tell us the name. Oh my God! I didn't even. I'm glad you said that because I didn't even. I didn't even think. I mean, ultimately, I talk about everybody, right? Yeah. So you you'll hear them through the book. But in terms of of uh, the ones that became behind, my mother's sister Irene. And I and I, one of the chapters I talk about Irene. Irene was actually the first person in my fa family, other than Uncle Frank in the dream. Um, he was the very she was the very first person to attend a fireside in the 50s. And 
Oscar and Freddie, actually Freddie became Baha'i, then brought Oscar into the faith. Then I became a Baha'i. All my siblings became Baha'is. That would be Oscar, um, Iris, myself, my brother Aaron, who has now passed away. Um, actually, my older brother, Malcolm, did not become a Baha'i. He's my half brother, but we, we never looked at him as a half brother. But he lived in Louisiana. He never, he never was raised with us. Um, but all of our children became Baha'i. So we have my, my aunt, my mother's sister, and then we have the generation of, of my, our siblings. And then we have my children and now my grandchildren that have embraced the faith. So we have, that's our legacy thus far. That's where we, um, the, all the characters in terms of being Baha'is, um, where they all are. So we are very, um, we are just, we feel, we feel richly blessed by all of that. And, uh, and, and Oscar, um, so what's your second question? Second question. My second question, you had mentioned that your parents said you all come from smart people. But I think they also must have taught you that you come from optimistic, <laughs> happy people as well. And you didn't, you didn't tell, tell us about that because you know some African-American people quite legitimately are cynical. Some are quite legitimately pessimistic. That's right. And I'm not saying you don't have some of that too, because I'm sure you have some of that. No, of I don't think you can be a Baha'i and have uh, have that kind of pessimism. You know, um, I uh, recently was interviewed. Um, I was recently interviewed, and during the interview, um, someone asked me a very a very similar question about how do you do it. Uh, almost every single presentation I've ever done, there are always black people. I just did a talk for the uh, May. Yeah. Where where did we go? Who did I do that talk for? Where all the the recruits were. United States Coast Coast Guard Academy in, 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 in uh, Connecticut, New London, Connecticut. New London, Connecticut. Fifteen hundred cadets, right? I just wow. I just did this talk. Um, it was pretty. It was it was absolutely amazing, absolutely amazing. And what happened is after the talk, all the black cadets waited for me to come off the stage because they wanted to talk to me specifically. And the very first question is. How do you do this work and not be angry? How do you not, you know, be furious and enraged? And, you know, just that was the very first question that was coming from these cadets, you know, and it was interesting because, you know, the writings are very, very clear. You know, matter of fact, I remember Peter Kahn saying, and, you know, Abdu'l-Baha said, I did not tell them more that I might not sadden them. <laughs> right? Abdu'l-Baha <laughs> said, there's a lot of tough stuff to read uh, in the in in the writings but 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 in this interview that i i had um i started to think about what it must have felt like for people who were who were enslaved i actually have pictures of me with the cadets my husband showing them to me um but uh you know when when people have asked me about that how do you stay you know positive i i always think about you know, Baha'u'llah said, remember my days during thy days and my distress and banishment in this remote prison and be thou so steadfast in my love that thy heart shall not waver. Yeah. You know, when you when you think about suffering, when I think about a mother having a baby taken from her arms and told to go back in the fields and work, what am I? Wait a minute. <laughs> Hold up. How, what am I? What, what am I complaining about here? <laughs> you know, really, you know, really. Uh, when I start looking at that trajectory and, um, you know, I think that for me, the, my family was the picture of, of hope. My father was an incredible storyteller and he, he made me dream. You know, I, I just felt like my family was the, the, the biggest and the best and the toughest of anybody out there. And it wasn't until I was older that I saw just how worn and how, assaulted they had been, you know, they, that was not something I grew up believing. I grew up with this whole sense of just tell a degree that they can't do it. Just, just go on and tell us that there's something we can't do. <laughs> there's no better incentive for a degree is for you to tell us we can't. Right. So I always had that. And my grandmother, she would smile at me. I was so small, literally, I was so small that I was looking up at her hand and she would point 
You come from, don't forget, Joy, you come from smart people. It's what she would always say. And I started doing it with my grandkids when they were very little. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's, it's one of those where, of course, I feel um, the heaviness, you know, and, and I know that we, we have permission for that. The Bob grieved for months yeah. over the, of the martyrdom of Kodus and Mullah Hussein, you know. So the grief, and, but it, it can't stop you. Yeah. It's got to motivate you, right? So what's question number three? You said that when you were 11, you had a, you did a debate about Martin Luther King and Malcolm X. <laughs> what did 11 year old Joy say? Well, that was the funniest thing in the world. I was in the Black Panther breakfast program. Oh. Which, yeah, that's, that's what, it was the breakfast program. And in our community, uh, you know, it, what, the way we saw the Black Panthers and the Brown Beret, by the way, they worked together. So you had the, uh, the, the Latinx branch, the Brown Berets in full regalia. You had the Black Panthers in full regalia. And they were all teaching us. We had the breakfast program. We had all these things we had to learn about history. There were all of these wonderful, rich things, so different from anything you hear about those groups now. It's just so mm -hmm. distorted. It because they literally were doing community service. They were yeah. feeding kids in the community. And so they had this, they said, we want you to discuss. One of us had to, had to, had to discuss one individual, either Mar I, I actually was talking about uh, the relevance of Malcolm. The other young man was talking about the relevance of Martin Luther King and what they each brought. And then there was a vote on who won the debate. And I won the, I won the debate. Uh -huh. and, and I remember... You know, you got to remember, this is the other thing that, that people in my family, you know, I was my sister Iris and Oscar, you know, that I didn't get I didn't get a normal childhood. <laughs> so I, didn't have a, I was not a normal child either. Let me just say that I read my I read my diaries. I promise you this is the truth. I've been thinking about putting one of them in the book. Well, I don't think so. I started writing my diary at eight years old. Wow. St Stapled, I have pictures of it. It's stapled together with some glued rocks, making it like a, 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 a ring, a diamond ring. And then do not open private personal is written all over it. And it's like stapled, I don't know, 10 pages, right? But I read that eight-year-old, the 11-year-old. Then I had one at 14 and one at 15. I didn't write anymore after that. Because then I'll do my, no, then Oscar, Oscar told me about uh, Juliet Thompson and, uh, and diaries. He goes, you know, <laughs> people yeah, do so I kind of went back and said, yeah, I think I'm going to get rid of them. So after 15, I didn't write any more diaries, but I did start journaling. And I think that started me. Part of my writing was therapeutic. But I tell people right now, I was a troubled child because I was I was laughing so hard when I read these little diaries. It wasn't even funny. But I was very, very, as you might know, I'm intense now. You can imagine how unbridled passion I was at 11. You know, I felt very strongly about things. I put my whole heart into it. And I think that's probably what won the debate more than whatever I said. But I was very, I remember being very intense because I had read, you know, my brothers and sisters were handing me the fire next time, autobiography of Malcolm. Those are the kind of books I was given at like nine, you know. <laughs> So I, um, you know, I had a lot of background in it and uh, I don't think my uh, <laughs> my my co-debater <laughs> you know, had quite that um, uh, library of information, which I did uh, because my they insisted my sister would give me books and then question me or test me on it. Like, really? Oh. You know, I was like nine and 10 years old. I remember this. And I remember reading The Fire Next Time by Baldwin. And I'm like, what am I doing reading that at 10? You know, it's crazy. But anyway, um, that was me. And it was it was very, uh, and, and again, both of us were received awards or whatever it was, but they were like yelling and clapping. <laughs> you know, when, when they, had, they got a chance to vote. And it was really my first inkling into uh, you know, really understanding how important it is to, to be able to tell your story and to be able to, to, to speak uh, truth uh, when everyone's not going to agree with you, you know, and that was something that we learned very early on from my father uh, about the fact that says it doesn't matter who you talk to, you do it appropriately, you do it respectfully. 
but you, there is never a question that is not appropriate to ask. There's never uh, something that's bad about, you know, you wanting to know something. If you want to know, of course, you're going to go to the people that do know. Now, you have to understand, I also grew up in a time and a culture where children are supposed to be seen and not heard. Uh, children, you don't, you don't, you're not in the presence of adults. My father didn't believe that. He says, how can they learn? He said, how can they learn if they can't listen to and question and ask questions of adults? Now, my aunts and uncles really frowned on that. Uh, very, very offended by that whole notion. My father said, my children get to be here. <laughs> they just get to be here. So, you know, it didn't earn us a lot of uh, friendship with some of our cousins. But, <laughs> you know, um, it's probably the reason why we're Baha'is to this day, because we've been taught to seek and we've been taught to question. And that's how we became Baha'is. Yeah. Well, that's what the elder Kennedy did to all of his sons and all his daughters. They did really? it around the dinner table on Sundays. And they're all growing up. I didn't know that. I didn't yeah. know that. Yep. And that produces leadership in the long term. It will indeed. Well, I I'll, probably, that too. I'll probably I come up with other yeah, I'll probably come up with other questions, but meanwhile, right. a few others here. Uh, Jennifer says, Do you have a favorite dawnbreaker? Oh, my God. Wow. A favorite dawnbreaker. Jeez. I got to say Tahare. Um, and the reason is, OK, two, Tahare and Zainab. Zainab was the one who cut her hair to, to fight with the men. You know, what is that? There's a movie out about a, a, a I think it's an Asian girl who cuts her hair and she fights with the men. And the moment I saw that, I said, did they take that from Zainab? Right. Um, but uh, it just, it, it moved me. And, and of course, uh, Tahare, uh, I remember when I was, I was, I was probably 14 and I went to Oscar and I said to him, I said, is it possible for me to just teach the faith and nothing else? Cause that's all I want to do. Right? <laughs> he says, well, you're gonna have to get a job, Joy. I'm sorry, wow. but you're gonna, he said, but you can you can make certain that what you do make make certain that is as close to teaching as you can you can can make it. And I go, I just want to be like Tahare. And he's asked me if I knew what the Guardian admired most about her. Huh. And I wrote it down in my prayer book. I still have it to this day, that very same prayer book where I wrote down the qualities of Tahare that the Guardian um, mentions and he, he felt what were most praiseworthy. And it was her um, unquenchable enthusiasm, mm -hmm. fearlessness, organizing ability. <sighs> fearlessness, organizing ability, unquenchable enthusiasm. And I can't remember the fourth one now. It's, I'm going to blank. It'll come to me. But I wrote them down, those four in my prayer book. That's impressive. That's impressive. And, and, uh, and it, was, it, was, it, was, it was her. It was, it was what she did. It was her sacrifice that really drove me as a youth. You know, it really was, you know, and skill. It was her skill. Her, I, I did the word just, I, I sent my brain to go find it. So it's skill, organizing ability, unquenchable enthusiasm, and fearlessness. And it was those four qualities that I endeavored to, to develop myself in order to do the work that Tahare did uh, as she sacrificed her life. Um, and so, yeah, she's my, my go-to. Yeah, that makes sense. Anne says, wonderful presentation. Your joy and enthusiasm and insight are contagious in such a good way. Do you see progress in terms of race relations in America? Absolutely. Um, and I think the Baha'is are going to be crucial here. Mm -hmm. I think the Baha'is are going to be crucial in this. If you, I remember when the House of Justice and all the Baha'is freaked out, remember, I, I can't, I'm trying to remember when it was. I want to say it's around the peace statement where they said, use, look to the Baha'is as an example. Remember that? And we all like went, what? Yeah. <laughs> You serious? And we're like, we're not ready in the House of Justice. You better get ready because I think um, in the House Justice indicated in the recent letter that, you know, they're going to come for us. And the reason they're going to come after Baha'is is because we promote the one thing they don't want, and that's race unity. We promote this whole idea of races coming together. And that is not what a, a huge faction of this country wants to hear. So you gonna have to, whatever you say you believe, you're going to get called on it. And I think many of us already are. I mean, you know, 
I'm, my book's being banned and videos are being banned in school districts already. I mean, that, that, that comes as no surprise, even though I don't teach, quote, critical race theory. But it doesn't matter. Anything, uh, that, that, but the cow's out of the barn. Okay, <laughs> cow's out of the barn. You can't put the cow back. And but there is a real effort to do so to the point where we are seeing these uh, these acts of terrorism and uh, just literally insanity that's going on. But it's fear that's driving all of this. It's fear. Uh, and I do, but I do believe this is. I mean, this is why this is what we're here for. This is our stuff. Yeah. I, I just want to say to anybody who's listening, this is our stuff. This we're the experts in this. So guess what? Who's going to have to show up and be on the front line? That's going to be Baha'is. You say you believe it, you better stand on it because they're coming for you. <laughs> okay, They're already coming for me. I'm used to it. But um, they are coming for us and they're going to come much harder as the House of Justice tried very delicately to prepare us for in that last letter. Um, and I think that, um, you know, it's but it's not something that I guess I'm uh, I'm not fearful. I am concerned about our youth very concerned. I think we should be having some very different conversations with kids. I think the kind of stuff that they're battling with, I couldn't even conceive of. And the stuff that's going online on online is worse than anything I've ever seen. So I think we better show up and pay attention uh, because they're the ones we're passing the baton to. And I'm not sure they know there is even a race <laughs> going on. Yeah. Uh, so I, that matter of fact, that's where a real focus of my work is right now is working with young people all over the United States. Um, and of course, you know, charity begins at home, working with my own kids and grandkids. Yep. They're not kids anymore, my kids. So working really with my grandkids. <laughs> they they prepare for, for Ema's deepening. I, I come in and do deepenings with my grandkids. We were doing deepening Zooms and now I fly in to check on them. And every single time they've just, they've matured so much more in, around the work. We're reading gleanings and they're, they're, they've matured so much uh, just I remember in the beginning getting them, you know, to be focused and then them really getting it and now seeing how it interfaces with their own lives uh, because they're going to need that. They're going to need that to be able to withstand the level of testing that's happening and going to happen. Uh, Shaheen asked a question. I'm not quite sure what I'm sure. I'm not quite sure what he's asking. He asked about a book being uh, for both Baha'is or for non Baha'is as well. And I suppose. You can say that about both post-traumatic slave disorder and about the book you're currently working on. So perhaps you could say something. Yeah, you know, that was, that was, thanks for asking that question because it was a very difficult one. And so I think Nat, if he could have it his way, he'd go, write it for the number. Nat Yogachandra, the head of the publishing trust. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Oh, yeah, Nat. Yeah. yeah. So, so I, I think um, nobody out there in the field that knows about my work um, all of them know I'm a Baha'i. All of, I mean, it's no, it's no, it's no secret. You know, I, I, I quote the writings in my presentations and in my book. So there's no confusion that I'm a Baha'i. I think there are a lot of people that are curious about my family and how I became Baha'i and why we still are Baha'is, because, you know, a lot of stuff Baha'is believe it's not in vogue. OK, um, and it's interesting, either they forgive me or they or they embrace it. There are a number of people, I, by the way, I've just recently uh, heard about. I only knew about uh, actually two people. And now a third person has written to me and said, you taught someone the faith years ago and they are now coming to our uh, Rui classes uh -huh. and have embraced the faith. One individual that never met me, read my book found out I was a Baha'i, investigated the Baha'i faith, became a Baha'i, and I've never met him. Mm -hmm. But another Baha'i from his community uh, said, you probably would like to know that this individual that you have never seen purely because of your book became a embrace of faith. So I'm like, oh, I could die now then. I could just go on and die. <laughs> right? that is, that's a nice thing to happen, though. That's for sure. I think. Oh, my God, yes. So, yes, I think it's going to be, um, I'm writing it in a way where there, there's just going to be a lot there for anybody. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure that it'll be definitely something in non uh will, and it'll give them people who are interested insights into, um, into who I am. But uh, I think uh, the documentary that my nephew is making uh, is going to be really powerful. I think it's going to be really great. Um, and it'll be able to really, I think, really help people see and flush out some of the things that I talk about in the book. 
Okay. Um, but yeah, it's for Baha'is and non-Baha'is. And in this documentary, will it relate to the topic of the book then closely? Or is it cover some of the same ground? The book, uh, the you know, it's interesting. My nephew is doing, um, <laughs> thank you. I've been looking at, is that Shole Young? Yeah. Love you too. Um, I, I, you know, I'm thinking about really uh, the, the documentary being, uh, and my nephew is doing this documentary. So there's two reasons he's doing it. One, um, in response to a report that we're going to be making to, uh, at the end of this year to MacArthur Foundation right. after I've done this whole year. So he did this thing. He sent it to me yesterday, just a clip. Mm-hmm. He told me I couldn't show it to anyone. And I cried. I cried. The little short clip that he showed me. And my husband saw it. The only one he gave me permission to show it to. Just, it was so beautifully done that I think that when he puts this whole piece together, it's going to be really my life work. Mm-hmm. Because now the symposiums, which are called, by the way, and my private nonprofit organization uh, that I'm formulating right now, the Articles Incorporation, um, is called Be the Healing. So the, the name of my nonprofit is Be the Healing. So everything right now in my life in terms of the work, post-traumatic, all post-traumatic. Remember, the book is called Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome, America's Legacy of Enduring Injury and Healing. That was the yes. name of the book. Nobody ever got the and healing yes. part. Because now what I'm able to legitimately do, because I don't have to continue to argue that there is an injury. I mean, we, we know that genetically there's an injury. So we are, and it's clear when you start seeing people get mowed down in churches and everywhere. Yeah, there's some still injury going on. It's a problem there, yeah. It's a problem. So now we can really focus more directly on the healing. What does that look like? And how do we, what are we, what are we telling the children? Uh, what are we doing uh, about this stuff that we're seeing? We cannot afford to ignore it now. And as Baha'is, we have a particular uh, need to move it forward. So the documentary will really, I think fold in the uh, the bigger picture, beginning with post traumatic, but really changing the trajectory uh, of growth, improvement, and healing. Hmm. Fantastic, fantastic. What are your other upcoming projects? I assume you've been thinking beyond the book, but of course, oh like, yes, beyond the book. It's always hard to think beyond the book. Let me tell you what I'm doing. Okay, this because I'm in. I, you know, like I said, I'm not in the country now. I'm going to Bellagio, Italy, in July meeting with members of the European Union to talk about reparations, believe it or not. And, and we're going to the Vatican. <laughs> okay, I am among a small group of people that are being invited to the, the Vatican uh, to speak with the Pope. Okay. Um, and then in, um, in August, we're going to a summit in Accra, oh, Ghana. Wow. And this summit, is going to be a combination of Africans, African leadership, and African Americans also talking about reparations, repair, and apology. Wow. So it's powerful. I mean, so those are the two two big things that are coming up right now. Um, And of course, my final symposium in in June in Atlanta, which I'm really excited about as well. Um, But that's, I mean, that's what's on the you know, that's if the world can stay glued together long enough for me to be able to go anywhere, right? Um, because, you know, I'm not certain what's moving faster, the, the, the accelerated, you know, movement and growth or the deterioration, which is, I, I, I don't even look at the news. <laughs> it's just scary. If you want a your horror movie, look at the news. It is. That's true. Yeah. It's very true. That's very, very true. Well, I'm trying to think what else to mention here. Several people have thanked you, of course. One person asked whether there are any plans for an e-reader version of the book. And I don't know if we can actually answer that question since that's something the Publishing Trust probably will do. So, I, I mean, I, the, the one thing that is, I know people are so mad at me, but it's probably a good thing that I'm going to um, do a... Uh, um, uh, several people who have a visual impairment have really got on me about the fact that um, neither of my books, one of them, they want me to put it on to record it, to read the book. Um, <laughs> here's the problem. I'll tell the truth. I wrote the book. But if at about unless I am got tons of coffee by the third page, I'm falling asleep. <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> so I, I that is the hardest thing in a way. I've never even thought about having to read the book. You know what yeah. I mean? I can talk about the book, but having to read it. Oh, my God. Someone 
kill me. I'd rather gnaw my arms off. But I am going to do it because people are have asked for it. And um, and there is an e version of my book. There is a it's on Kindle. It's post traumatic on Kindle or something. Yeah. I don't know which one it is because I don't handle that part. But definitely, this book will have to we'll, we'll put that in the hands of the publishing trust. They'll have to figure that that part out. Yeah. I'm trying to see if we have any other questions. Boy, do we have a, a poll? Seems to me we have a poll for everybody. A poll. A poll. I think we do. Boyd, he'll pop in in a second here with the answer to that question. Um, Nat Yogachandra developed a little poll that we can ask everybody who's attending about what they wanted to hear about or why they joined us so that we have a good idea of what the audience right. is interested in. Um, but, but I haven't heard from Boyd yet. I think. <laughs> we know he's around. We know he's. The, yeah. he, we'll have to keep asking him to to appear. Wait a minute! Uh, I sorry, I'm sorry, no polls, guys. No, no, no poll. polls, guys. No poll this time. Okay. No poll. Okay. Well, that's because uh, probably because it's not actually on the theme of a particular age group, which was we were want to know how many people were writing children's books, for example. Oh, oh, oh children's yeah. Book program program this morning, that kind of thing. So, well, that's good to know. Well, I oh, we have another question here by Sally. Can you liken the Black experience to the Native American experience? Of course. I mean, I think, in fact, what's so amazing, look, I'm so glad you asked that. So at my last symposium, um, there were a group of my really dear friends, uh, Baha'is who are um, indigenous folks that were at my conference. And I have, and this is good, I'm a, you know, I, I almost got away without something controversial. So here's the thing. I have been asked, and I've been in a lot of spaces where people do land acknowledgements, right? And I hate them. <laughs> okay, I hate them. <laughs> I just hate them. I just think it's self-serving. It's another way for people to pat themselves on the back and go, oh, yeah, we stole, we pillaged, we raped. We're acknowledging it. Now, <laughs> now, let's, get on with the meeting. now let's get on with the meeting. Really? So yeah. anyway, these a group of Baha'is and um, who are indigenous folks, Mary, um, Mary Gubatayo, her whole family, mm -hmm. uh, the folks that uh, actually Seattle Baha'is um, and uh, the confederated tribes. And anyway, they she got up and she actually you know, said that what people should be actually saying, is there any indigenous people in the room? that can give permission for this to happen. And it was so beautiful. She came up, she did a song, she did a prayer, because this is, you're going to say if it's your space, right? If you really want to do it right, it should be an Indigenous person. And the only time it ever felt right for me is when it was an Indigenous person acknowledging the land, as opposed to somebody who doesn't have a clue, can barely describe or pronounce the name of the tribe, and then says, okay, now let's get on with the agenda. It's offensive. You're not going to say, well, are you going to give it back? Are you going to give some proceeds to the groups that just whose land has been stolen and pillaged? Yeah. Really? Otherwise, what? Are, who is it serving? I'm just saying. I feel very strongly about it, but I defer to my indigenous brothers and sisters. If they okay with it, I'm okay with it. But I won't do it. They asked me to do a land acknowledgement. I said no. I will not. It's offensive to me. It's insulting after the fact that we've done nothing to repair it. Yeah. No. Okay. So anyway, yes, our, our relationship to our experience is very closely related. And I, and as I do more and more work with the indigenous community, also the Jewish community, mm -hmm. I've been doing work with both communities um, and really realizing that in the, in the, the Latinx community and, you know, folks, generally people who have experienced the same kinds of things. And Abdu'l-Baha was very clear about um, whether or not this country was going to be able to move until it engaged indigenous people and started to do uh, the due diligence to make that right. Uh, and to have uh, indigenous people in the forefront uh, moving forward in um, the decisions uh, and the, the whole trajectory of, of healing. So very, very much, um, very, very much in, in concert with with uh, indigenous people. That's a very interesting comment because the land, land acknowledgement is something that's becoming a more common occurrence, I think. And I think you made some very interesting points about it that need to be, people perhaps need to figure out how they can go beyond land, land acknowledgements. Right. That's, a, that's a very good point. When 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 will your book be out? Do you think? 
<laughs> I can't stop moving. You know, the problem that I have is that I am not retired. God bless my husband. He is retired, <laughs> but I am not. And because I have to also work and I work a lot and my work takes me all over the world, um, it makes it a little more difficult. But I do have a few people helping me now um, that is going to, I think, is going to, you know, kind of benefit me in terms of uh, the editing, figuring out what to go and what's not. Uh, I'm also having another, my extended family that is uh, sharing with me a little bit more in terms of our history and names and, you know, chron chronicling things that are going on. And I don't want to get too much into the minutia because that's not as important mm -hmm. as the actual journey itself. Like I have a whole chapter on Hands of the Cause because I grew up in Los Angeles, Baha'i community. You know, all the Hands of the Cause came through there. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, all of them you know, came through there when I was a youth. And one of them, uh, Mr. Abu Qasim Faizi, and the cause of God, uh, came to Oscar's house for a fireside and I have pictures of it. Um, and I remember when he walked in the room, we had wild, anybody who knows that's on here that knows, we had some wild and out firesides where the ministers would be coming in there and they had their Bibles. And, you had, and one of these, it was packed. And Mr. Fazy came through the door. I think he came with um, Mona Grisu Yazdi and uh, uh, Richard, her husband. They, I think they brought Mr. Fazy. And we had our regular Saturday night firesides that would go all on all night. And Mr. Fazy walked in the room. Now, remember, there are people heated, got the Bible open, talking about antichrist and all kind of stuff going on, right? And Oscar's there and Burl Bullock and Jerry Sinclair and everybody. It's intense. And Mr. Fazy walks through the door and the entire room changed. I mean, there was like, the all nobody said, oh, this is, and you know, being who he is, he went all the way in the other room to the back of the room and sat in a chair in a corner. That's where Mr. Fazy went. But the entire energy in the room changed. And I have that story in the book, entire energy. But what's happened is I didn't have the original pictures. So now people have been sending me the original pictures. Wow. I have pictures of the pictures, but I uh, folks are sending the original pictures now so, ne so that I can include them because I, that's the other thing I don't know about the publishing trust um, is how you do all that. I, because there are other people in the picture. Right, and, right. I tried to find as many people as I knew to get their permission to be able to put the picture in. I don't know, but like that kind of stuff where there are plenty of people who are at that fireside, um, Mr. Fazy, without saying a word, changed the entire energy in the room, even to the, the folks who were not Baha'is, all of a sudden just changed. They didn't know what happened and they didn't know who he was. All they knew was everything Different. just <laughs> chilled out. Uh, but you know, those are some of those miraculous moments, but we have pictures of it, which is really cool. How can we encourage more African Americans and people of color to write their stories and to publish about the faith? Here's what I really think. Um, here's, here's a difficulty. Okay. Anybody who knows me, if you read my, the way I, I actually write, write the way I talk and I write, I've learned to hone that because I have to write journal articles and book chapters and, um, you know, as a, in the academy, you know, being, you know, an academic, everybody's not an academic yeah. and everybody doesn't. And I think we need to make room for people to be able to write their stories, to aid and give assistance without dictating how it needs to be. Am I making sense? Yeah, yeah. It's like, you know, people, part of what happens to African-American people, you know, growing up, you have African-American people that'll be in a room that don't want to speak because they don't, they think they don't speak as well as other people, or they don't use the words as mm -hmm. what, you know what I'm saying? That stigma and that stuff is still out there. Sure. And when you look at the publishing trust, there's this big organization and everybody's got letters behind their names. And you, you know what I'm saying? So okay. I think, we need to create an environment that invites people to express themselves and to tell their stories the way they tell them, you know, and how they can tell them. And then we can go in and we can maybe do some assistance. But I think it gets stifled when people go, oh, God, I don't belong here. I don't I, I don't I don't know how to write like that. Yeah. You know, I tell people do do a video, audio, you know, audio. Yes. 
do an audio of it, you know, just so that we can capture those stories and we can have somebody else, you know, can transcribe it or whatever. But I don't think that's ever talked about. You know what I mean? When I'm in these environments, it's all so academic. It's so you know, and I'm not, you know, I'm not suggesting that everybody black needs it that way, but I know that there's some people who have phenomenal stories that yes. we're never going to hear because they don't talk like you do and I do. Yes. They talk the way they do, right? Um, and they and they may need some support and they would want somebody who's going to help them that's not going to humiliate them. Yes. Right. Yes. So I think that that's how we can get more people um, and also have more black folks at the helm that are making that invitation. It says, look, if you have yes. that interest, I will help you. I'll get some other folks that look like you to help you. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's just it. People feel more comfortable when they see themselves represented. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I believe we're at the end of our evening and it has been a very exciting and I think very enriching experience for all of us. Uh, many people in the audience are thanking you for en your energetic, beautiful, inspiring program. And uh, I think probably many people who haven't posted any comments would completely agree, of course, with that. So Joy, thank you again very much on behalf of the Baha'i Publishing Trust and, the, and on behalf of the Wilmot Institute for this evening. One person says, so very grateful. Thank you so much. Amazing <laughs> presentation. So we're getting the accolades pouring in. And uh, as I said, all my friends, now I'm seeing all these folks that I know, I almost never look at the chat because it always throws me off. But I yeah. do see all of your comments and I miss you all too and love you back. Uh, it's so wonderful to be in this environment. Hey, we're still hanging in there. We got a lot of work to do. It's really good to know that uh, we're still in there, you know. Well, we're, we're, we're glad to know that Joy is collaborating with us on all of these things, too, because that's right. energy will help carry us forward. And uh, we're very, very grateful again. So thank you very much. And I want to thank the audience also so much tonight for joining us. And remember, tomorrow we've got two more presentations at 9 a.m. and noon Pacific time, which is noon and 3 Eastern time. And we look forward to seeing you then as well. So <laughs> good night to everyone. Good night. Bye -bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.